What rank are you? I've got you down as commander, but I think you're an Air Force colonel as well. Yeah, that's the commander is a Navy thing, and I kind of hate that. But National Geographic used that on my book because I was the space station commander. But I am a retired Air Force colonel. I see. Okay. Well, I want to talk to you about your book. I also want to talk to you about some stuff you've written uh, recently that looked to me like you were criticizing NASA's plans for the future. But before we get to any of that, let's get some background about you. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Maryland, in between Baltimore and Washington, in a town called Columbia uh, on the East Coast. And what kind of a kid were you? Were you interested in space back then? I'm guessing you were. I was the first book I ever read was about Apollo in kindergarten. It was one of those, you know, kid reader books about Buzz and Neil landing on the moon. Uh -huh. And so I was captivated from a very young age about airplane. I grew up with airplanes and space posters on my wall. So you weren't old enough to to watch Neil's first walk on the moon on TV. No, I was more like the space shuttle was just coming online when I was you know, old enough to know what was happening. I was a baby, you know, when Apollo was happening and, and ending. But really, my, my conscious life was uh, when we didn't have a space program, and then finally the space shuttle launched. And I can remember watching that as a teenager. Right. And so you were at school, you were, it was mathematics was your thing, right? Yeah, I, w I was really a math and science kid, which is funny now because I'm an author and I wrote a book. And the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that communicating is as important or maybe in some cases more important than the technical things. But when I was younger, I really liked the technical stuff. And it's funny now that I've got a book out and I'm doing speaking. My fourth grade teacher, Mr. Swisher, got in touch with me through Facebook and he was telling me stories of things he remembered from me, you know, fourth grade was a long time ago and I was shocked that he remembered some of the stuff <laughs> just the curiosity that I had um, what kind of stuff was he telling you then well he remembered a field trip we took to Washington DC and I brought a prism with me and I remember that I had a magnifying glass and stuff and he he told me that I spent 15 minutes explaining to him how a prism worked and uh, I can totally see my my younger self doing that I was a very curious kid I I got a camera for myself and taught myself how to uh, take pictures with a Konica SLR camera. I, I had a telescope. My parents got me a telescope for my birthday, and they bought me an old TRS-80 computer in 1980, I think it was. And I, this computer didn't have any memory, or there was no, certainly no hard drive, or it didn't even have a disk drive or anything. So you could turn it on and then you'd have to write a program yourself if you wanted it to do anything. So I learned how to do basic uh, when I was in middle school on my own. I, was, I guess I was kind of a curious uh, kid interested in different stuff. So what was the moment when you decided, you know, you got an interest in space. Yeah. But when did you decide, I'm going to be an astronaut? So my whole life, I wanted to be an astronaut, but that's a crazy desire. I mean, nobody actually gets to do that, right? But I figured out what you needed to do, and being a pilot looked like a good thing, and I wanted to be a pilot anyway, and having a technical degree was important and which is what I liked anyway. And so I kind of checked all the boxes that you needed to be an astronaut along the way. And that, there was a moment when I was in Germany as an F-16 pilot and I was trying to decide, do I want to go to test pilot school to try to be an astronaut or do I want to try and be on the Thunderbirds or do I want to go to weapon school, which would be more of an operational F-16 guy. And, and I just came to this, thought I'm like you know being an astronaut is probably not going to happen it's a crazy dream but it's my dream and I need to go for it like I just need in order to be honest to myself I need to pursue it if I don't pursue it I'll be 80 years old in a rocking chair kicking myself I should have tried out so that moment came probably in 1997 when I was an F-16 pilot based in Germany and that was it you just decided you're going to go for it I decided I was going to go for the test pilot school track. I applied for test pilot school, ended up at Edwards Air Force Base. And then while we were there, NASA said, we're going to have a new shuttle class of astronauts. And I went ahead and applied while I was still a student. And all my classmates were like, why are you applying now? You don't have enough experience. You should wait, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you're right. I'm not. This other guy's smarter than me. This other guy's better looking than me. But I'm going to go ahead and apply because who knows? And I ended up getting picked. And uh, unfortunately, the classmates who were smarter or better looking than me didn't because 
NASA didn't have another class for a long time. They only picked one guy, blah, blah, blah. So the lesson I learned from that was don't tell yourself no. If there's something, that, a dream that you have, something you want to do, go for it. And if you don't get it, you can try harder. You can try the next time. You can change your plans. But if you don't even apply for it or try for it or go for it, you'll regret not trying later on. So the, I guess the lesson that I learned is don't pick yourself down. Sometimes it works out in my case. And even if it doesn't, at least you try it. Yeah. And what's the worst thing that can happen is you just get a no. But the important thing is to let someone else say no. Don't you say no. It's a really important lesson. That's the lesson that, that I've learned in, in my career. That's terrific. So that's a fairly traditional way of becoming an astronaut from being a, a jet pilot, a fighter pilot to a test pilot to then astronaut, isn't it? It is. And the last thing I did at NASA when I, last year, I was helping them go through the 18,000 seconds that we had to be uh, in the new astronaut class. And there's lots and lots of people that want to be astronauts. And the one thing that everybody needs for NASA anyway is a technical degree, some kind of math or science or medicine or uh, engineering. But there are different paths. You know, the pilot. I think is a great path and flying is the best preparation for space flight. But we had medical doctors, we had engineers, we had scientists. So there are different career paths that you can take. And the astronaut office is full of people from all of those different career paths, not just pilots. When you were flying F-16s, did you see any combat? I flew over Iraq quite a bit, um, but it was during the 90s. Yeah, uh, It was before 2003 war, but yeah, I spent a tour in Korea, thankfully no combat there, but, you know, flying up and down the DMZ. And then I did end up doing kind of the no-fly zone work in the 90s. So what's scarier, flying in an aircraft that could be shot down or flying in a vehicle that's going to space? Well, the I mean, if you're rational, of course, going into space is way more. I mean, you're sitting on a rocket with millions of pounds of rocket fuel, so that's way more dangerous. Although, you know, if we if we had a, a shooting war against a really advanced adversary, then that would be, be, be probably more dangerous, too. Thankfully, knock on wood, our, our space program has had a very good safety records ever since the Columbia accident in 2003. Uh, and that's something that we can't let our guard down because the history is, you know, flying in space. If it goes well for a few years, people forget the accident and everybody thinks it's easy. Well, it's not easy. Like NASA is doing things and the Russian Space Agency launching Soyuz are doing things that are really, really hard. They just do it really well. It looks easy, but that doesn't mean it's easy. But for you personally, what was the scariest experience? Or is that a redundant kind of thing to say? Do you just not feel fear when you're a fighter pilot or an astronaut? I, so as a fighter and pilot and test pilot, I really never felt fear doing those things. I just, I probably should have. It shows that I'm probably not the smartest guy, but I just didn't feel fear doing these things. But I'll tell you, the biggest fear <laughs> that I had while I was in space was cutting my crewmate's hair. <laughs> Samantha is an Italian lady, yeah. and uh, I flew with her, and she's the most famous Italian woman in the world. And they do these polls, and she's like number one. And so before we went into space, she wouldn't let me fly until I went to her hairdresser with her and learned how to do a proper <laughs> lady's haircut. And so it's one of the things I never thought I'd do as a fighter pilot, but I learned the whole thing, how to hold the scissors, how to put the clips in. You know, for, for my hair, I just take the clippers, set it on number two, and, and you know, my hair is cut. But for hers, it was like this long process. And uh, it was nerve-wracking because if I screw that up, there's 30 million angry Italian mothers, right? <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't want, to, I didn't want to be that guy. I think that's be scary for anybody, even on the ground. I think to cut the hair of the most famous oh. lady in Italy, yeah. I did it on the ground before we, like, I sat there and her poor hairdresser for two and a half hours, like, talked me through cutting her hair. It was painful, but it, it worked out pretty good. You can, you can see pictures and videos online. Um, I think she, she was happy with it. So, okay, so you accepted to be an astronaut with NASA. How long then from being accepted till that first shuttle flight? It was a long time. For me, it was over nine years. Wow. The guys in my class and the class before me waited between eight and 12 years for the first flight. So what had happened in the late 90s, NASA just hired way too many astronauts. I think they hired 125 astronauts in five years. Mm -hmm. 
because the space station was being built and they needed all these astronauts. But then they decided not to, that, just not to fly rookies. So they hired all these new astronauts, but they only flew experienced astronauts to do the space station flights because they were, in theory, so complicated and hard to do. And then the Columbia accident happened. The space shuttle Columbia was destroyed, and that really slowed the program down for a few years. And so all these things combined to really make it a long wait for guys in my in my year group. Nowadays, it's not so bad. It's probably like five years as an average wait. But, you know, for me, it was almost a decade. It was worth the wait, though. I'm not definitely not complaining. And it was interesting while I was waiting, but it was a long wait. And are you training that whole time? So... Yes, so there's always training. There, there, we would have simulators. You know, every week or two, you go do a shuttle launch practice simulation or an orbital simulation. I worked as a Capcom for a few years, where I would go to Mission Control, and I would be the person talking to the crew in space on the radio. So we have we have a team of a flight director and his flight controllers that would run the mission and look at the data and come up with a plan. And me as Capcom, I would be the person that would take that plan and call it up to the um, guys in space. So I did that. There was a lot of T-38 flying. I did some support. I was like the ground support guy for astronauts on the space station. So I had different technical jobs yeah. and assignments. But, you know, there came a point, I, to be honest, it was probably like at the eight-year point where I was just, okay, this is enough waiting. I'm ready to fly in space. I've been here for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and it, so waiting for that first space flight definitely required some practice, some patience. Um, I had always been young. I'd always been the first. I'd always been the youngest of everything I'd done. And I got to NASA and then it was this giant put on the brakes and wait for a decade. And on, in all honesty, it was a great time. I was able to spend time coaching my kids sports, which was the best thing I've ever done in my life. And, you know, the time with the kids was great, but it was, uh, it was definitely a wait. And on that first space shuttle mission, you were the pilot. So that, I mean, does that, I mean, this sounds like a silly question, but does that mean that you fly the space shuttle? The, uh, what we call shuttle pilots is commander and pilot. And so the airliner analogy would be captain and co-pilot. So I was kind of like the co-pilot of the shuttle. So I was trained and ready to do everything the commander could do in case he, you know, passed out or, or couldn't do it. And you could fly, as, as a test pilot, the space shuttle was a dream vehicle because you could manually fly it during launch, um, during landing in the atmosphere when you were in orbit. And I did, in fact. I did a lot, a lot of the rendezvous burns manually while we were docking with the station. Um, when we left the space station, I manually flew the shuttle around. I did a big 360-degree lap around the station. And then once we came back to Earth and were flying in the atmosphere, I actually took the stick and flew it manually. Uh, and then the, I gave it over to Zambo, the commander, and he actually did the landing. But as a pilot, the space shuttle was an amazing flying machine, and it was really uh, a highlight of my career being able to fly that thing. Take me through a launch on a space shuttle, then. What's it like? The space shuttle is like a big muscle car. It's four million pound vehicle. It puts out seven million pounds of thrust and at launch it's it burned twenty three thousand pounds of rocket fuel every second. So when the engines lit off, there was no doubt that something really significant had just happened. <laughs> the sound of the, the three main engines on the shuttle itself was this amazing roar that I had never heard before. And then when you actually launch the two big white solid rocket motors on the side light off. And when those things light off, I was at four in the morning at nighttime and nighttime turned into day. I mean, it just got instantly daytime bright. The amount of roar and shaking and vibrating was just amazing. And, uh, and you get pushed back in your seat immediately. It's like being in a, uh, formula one race car, uh, and just slamming it on the gas and getting pushed back in your seat, except on a rocket and the Formula One race car. Uh, and I had a chance to drive a Ferrari, which yeah. was amazing. But that only lasts for a couple seconds, and then you're at max speed. On the space shuttle, you get that same acceleration for eight and a half minutes before you're at 17,500 miles an hour. So 
that acceleration lasts a long time as you're just going faster and faster and faster and climbing out of the atmosphere. And you've got all that violence of launch, and then suddenly you're completely weightless. Yeah, the violence of launch, and then like I saw the east coast of America at nighttime, and I saw um, the the rockets flashing. There were, and we saw the moon. We were pointed right at the moon. There were all these like amazing, surreal experiences. And then back to work because I'm a shuttle pilot. I got to monitor the engines and do all this other stuff. And then eight and a half minutes later. Boom. It's like a light switch happens and everything is weightless and everything is floating. And that is an experience you just don't get on Earth. You can get it in an airplane for a few seconds. But, you know, when you go to space, somebody turns on the weightless switch and it, it like it doesn't get turned off until you come back to Earth. And that is amazing. It's, it was it felt to me like the most powerful force I'd ever felt. Of course, it's not force. It's weightlessness. But that's what it seemed to be to me. And that definitely takes, there's a learning curve. It definitely takes some time to know how <clears throat> how to maneuver yourself and your body, how to keep track of your stuff, how to put your socks on in the morning. It's so entertaining to watch astronauts putting their socks on because they're floating <laughs> and you're reaching down trying to, trying to put them on. And there's all these grown men and women, you know, just like bouncing off the wall, trying to get their pants and their socks on and, um, but that's part of the fun of being in space. And how long does it take to adjust to weightlessness then? So for me, on my first flight, the, the first couple of days, I had a really bad headache. And a lot of people have headaches. Uh, you, all, a lot of your fluid that's down in your legs, when you don't have gravity, it floats up and there's a lot of pressure in your head and your vestibular system is all messed up. It doesn't know which way is up or down. And so I was taking a lot of ibuprofen until the morning of day three. And then all of a sudden, I felt fine and great. And the rest of the time, I just loved it. On my second flight, my body knew where it was immediately. It was like it had learned weightlessness, and boom, it was good. But I was uh, – that's like how you feel. But actually learning to work, to keep track of your stuff, how to float from point A to point B, um, how to throw tools to your crewmates. You always throw them high because your brain is used to gravity, compensating gravity. Yeah. So that skill, I mean, for me on my two-week mission, my first mission, I was still getting better. Like, I wasn't great by the end of the two weeks. But on my 200-day mission, you know, after a few weeks, I had really peaked out, and I, I felt like, man, I can do this. I, you know, I'm really good. I can get stuff done quickly. I can move from A to B fast. So the learning curve, that was a really interesting kind of self-examination to watch myself learn how to be a spaceman, how to operate in weightlessness. The learning process was fascinating. And we don't have the shuttle anymore. These days, to get to the International Space Station, it's the Soyuz. You've flown on that too. How do the two experiences, I'm talking about launch here, how do they compare, launching in a shuttle and launching in a Soyuz, which is basically 1967 technology? Yeah, it is. Uh, I launched from the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from. Wow, that would have been cool. It was really cool. I used to joke with my Russian friends. I'm like, the Air Force has a long history here in Baikonur because, you know, here I am, an Air Force colonel launching into space, and back in 1961, Gary Powers was flying over Baikonur in his U-2. <laughs> of course, <laughs> then he got yeah. But I love, I absolutely love flying with the Russians. Uh, I love training there. I really enjoyed uh, the people. I'm still good friends with uh, the cosmonauts I flew. In fact, I just saw Anton, my Soyuz Russian crewmate, um, yesterday in Houston. He's in Houston this week. So that was a real positive experience for me during all this tension with between the West and Russia. Obviously, it's been a bad couple of years, and I flew right in the middle of everything. We, impl we imposed sanctions while I was in space, uh, and yet we worked together great. One of the things I was the thing I was most proud about as commander was the cooperation I had with my Russian cosmonaut uh, friends and during this political time of tension. But the Soyuz vehicle itself, if the space shuttle is a muscle car, the Soyuz is a little sports car. It's a little MG or you know Roadster. It is a Russian. It's a Soviet ICBM basically that was converted to uh, have a Soyuz capsule instead of a nuclear warhead on top. And when you launch on that thing, it is 
bam, it's it's like digital. I mean, you get smashed back in your seat. It's and you accelerate really quickly. And when the engine shut down, you're violently thrown forward. And it's it's a digital launch experience that happens very quick. And there's just no messing around. I mean, like I said, it's a intercontinental nuclear rocket that they put us on top of, and its job is to get going into space quickly. And it it does it great. They've launched the Soyuz, I think, over two thousand times, so they have lots and lots of flight history on that rocket. And how many G's do you pull on a on a Soyuz? Yeah, the shuttle was limited to three G's, but you know, there's an airliner strapped to the side of a half inch thick aluminum tank with three struts, and so. <laughs> The shuttle was a little bit less G force. The Soyuz probably got up to four Gs, yeah, just because it was simpler and beefier structure and smaller. Uh, but the the G forces were pretty similar because you end up at the same speed and the same close to the same orbit. So uh, the experiences were similar, but there were definitely some big differences. And when you pull in the Gs, that's known as eyeballs in that one when you're going up, right? Right. It's like laying on your bed and having three of your best friends lay on top of you. That's kind of the amount of force, right? For three Gs, right. you weigh three times your, your normal weight. In an F-16, it's a 9G airplane, but that would be like sitting on a chair and having nine of your best friends sit on your head, right? So the force goes from your head down to your butt, and then it's in a different direction, which is actually a lot worse for the human body because it pulls blood out of your brain. Right. And you can pass out. And unfortunately, a lot of people and and fighters end up passing out and dying because they're passed out in in their airplane. Um, in this in the rocket, the force is you know from your chest to your back, so the blood doesn't get drained out of your brain, and you don't have that same G induced loss of consciousness, is what we call it. You don't have that same problem. And what about the differences in landing? You mentioned landing the shuttle. I mean, it lands like a like a glider. But the Soyuz is, is the old-fashioned uh, capsule descent. How's that? Yeah, the, the shuttle's 100 pounds. It's an airliner glider. And um, yeah. it, so it was very smooth. My, Zambo did a great, George Zamka, my commander, did a great landing. The Soyuz is like taking a bowling ball and dropping it out of a first-story window onto the ground. I mean, it is a – I. it's also another analogy is driving through your neighborhood and just, you know, it's so not high speed, but – driving in a car and just running into a telephone pole. It was like that level of, that's what it felt like to me. So it's a capsule, it's under a parachute, and it lands on land in the Kazakhstan desert. And it is a big thud. And when we hit, our capsule rolled over 360 degrees. Um, so it was, uh, normally it lands on its side. So the big Russian guy comes in and drags you out and puts you in a chair and you know, you're good. But when the capsule lands upright, like ours did, we had to crawl out of the capsule ourselves before the big guy could grab you and put you in the chair. So um, anyway, it was a much, much different landing experience. <laughs> what did you learn most from the Russians about space flight? You know, they, the Russians have just a j different philosophy about everything. Their, their systems tend to be simpler, more margin. And it's actually a great partnership to have some really complicated but capable American systems and some really simple but basic but reliable Russian systems. The water system always made me laugh because America has this really complicated recycling system that does atmosphere and oxygen and water and even recycles urine. And it's really good because water, everything is a hundred or $10,000 a pound. And if you can recycle water, you can save a lot of money. But it's also really complicated, and I spent two full weeks while I was in space working on the water system. The Russian water system is a tank of water with this pump. You grab the pump, and you pump up some pressure, and then there's a rubber hose, and you push the button, and water comes out. So, When you say you pump it up, what, you actually physically pull a handle? Like a bike pump, right? You pump right, the bike, yeah. air in it. You, you pump this pump. It puts air in the tank. It pressurizes it. Then you grab the rubber hose and you push a button and water comes squirting out. So it, you know, it's not the complicated recycling system. There's not complicated monitors and sensors and all this stuff. It's just a pump with a hose and you get water. But you know what? It always works. And I didn't have to spend a week of my time maintaining this complicated system. So, and having one of each was really good because 
we had a simple backup thing that worked, but we had this fancy complicated system that really did amazing things and, and allowed us to spend a long time in space without having to constantly launch water. So that's just one analogy of the bigger design philosophy differences between Russia and America. And ha having them both on the same vehicle was actually, uh, I think, a good combination. It's, you know, in a, in a good marriage, you want the husband and the wife to have, they each bring their own strengths, right? And it's it's good to have both. Vive la différence. And so that was uh, <laughs> that was my observation anyway. And you were commander on the International Space Station. What does that mean? Because you're not actually steering it. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> That's right. Well, you, we actually, there are rocket engines and you can maneuver it, but it's a million pound vehicle. So you talk about how hard it is to turn a battleship. Well, it's really hard to turn a million pound vehicle going 17,500 miles an hour. Pretty much Isaac Newton's in charge and it's going where it's going. But our Chinese friends blew up a satellite a decade ago with a anti-satellite weapon and they created this giant cloud of debris at the same altitude and orbit that the space station's in. Great. So I actually had to, I had to maneuver the station to avoid one of the pieces of debris from that Chinese uh, anti-satellite explosion from 2007. Uh, usually once or a couple times a year, the station has to maneuver to avoid orbital debris. In general, it's pretty much the flying happens automatically. There's guys on the ground that monitor the attitude and make sure it's upright and whatever. And astronauts in space, whereas on the space shuttle, I spent a lot of my time piloting the vehicle. On the space station, you spend almost none of your time doing that and almost all of your time maintaining equipment or doing science experiments. What did you learn most about yourself from spending the length of time you spent in space? Because what was how, how many days was it? It was a long, long time. Well, my most recent flight was 200 days. Yeah. yeah. So what did, what did you learn most about yourself spending that amount of time in space? You know, it's funny. The technical stuff obviously is important to make these vehicles work, but the, the fuzzy stuff, the interpersonal relationships, the uh, how does it impact you, that's really the, the more important aspect of space flight it, than th those things are more important than technical. And I, one of the, well, I do speaking for my new career. It's one of the things I'm doing. And one of the lessons learned, or I try and end my talks with a little bit about perspective. And although flying in space didn't change by, you know, religious views or philosophical views or whatever, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but they, I hope, took a little bit of the edge off. I'm, I'm not as much of a black and white. I'm probably more gray. And, the, the concerns and worries and cares of Earth are usually so silly and things are rarely as bad as they seem. And so what I, if I get too stressed out on Earth here, I'll try and take myself back to one of these unbelievable, I can't believe I'm seeing this, sunsets and just realize, hey, that somewhere on Earth right now that sun is setting, there's been a billion of these sunsets in the past, there'll be a billion more, and there's probably not the reason to be stressed out that I feel. Of course, that's easy to say. It's harder to harder to really not worry. But I guess that's one of the perspectives that I learned from my space flight. Flying in space is still very dangerous. What is the scariest thing that's happened to you up there? Well, as far as the other than cutting Samantha's hair, um, <laughs> we had an episode where the ammonia leak alarm went off. And the space station, there's different categories of alarms, cautions, warnings, emergencies. And there, there's three different types of emergencies that we train for. One of them is an air leak, um, which obviously is bad. Yeah. One of them is a fire. And then the third one is an ammonia leak. And f fire false alarms happen fairly often. Some of the smoke detectors there are not the best. And, you know, I saw multiple fire alarms went off. Thankfully, they were all false. There's been a few leak false alarms over the years, but when I was there in the 15 years of the space station program, this had never happened. And we had the first ever ammonia leak and it's really serious in training. They tell us that if you smell ammonia, don't worry about it because you're going to die. Wow. Ammonias are very deadly. And the station uses it the, the American half of the station uses it as a coolant fluid. So all this equipment and sunlight generates heat. And just like your car has radiator fluid, 
the space station has a cooling fluid, and ammonia works really, really well in the temperatures and pressure. It's a great fluid for transferring heat. It's just completely deadly. <laughs> so when the alarm went off, Samantha and I were in our crew quarters. We were, I was doing email. She was doing whatever. It was a work day. Just there we were minding our own business. We both popped our heads out of the crew quarters and looked at the panel. And I was like, is that a leak? Is that an air leak? And Samantha's like, no, that's ammonia. And so uh, we put on our oxygen masks. We floated down to the Russian side of the station and we closed the hatch. Yeah. Because the Russians use ammonia. They use basically sugar water, glycol. And it's not as good of a coolant fluid, but it doesn't kill you. So, again, differences in, in philosophy. And we spent the day there. The, the, the alarm actually happened twice. The first time they said false alarm, and then 20 minutes later they said, no, it's a real deal. So we went back to the Russian segment, and a gentleman by the name of Dmitry Rogozin, the Russian, he's the deputy prime minister. He's, you know, like the vice president there. He's a big official had been tweeting, trash-talking America about sanctions. Apparently, t Twitter and international leaders is a thing nowadays. So <laughs> in the middle of all this terrible, you know, Russia-U.S. stuff, he's the guy that walked me out to my Soyuz. I'm, I'm carrying my cooling box in this uncomfortable space suit. He walked me out to the Soyuz. And then a couple months later, here we are in space with this ammonia leak. And he called us up and said, American colleagues, you can stay as long as you want. We're going to work together. And so during this serious emergency, with all this political tension on the ground, it was a great example of America and Russia working together, you know, to basically to stay alive in space. Yeah. It, was, it was a really poignant moment for me. And, but we spent the day thinking that the space station is going to die. Like we, we were staring at each other going, we're the last people to be on the American half of the space station. Because if there is ammonia there, you can never go back because it's a deadly fluid. I mean, you could go back wearing ammonia protective gear, but you're not ever going to be able to use it, you know, for more than uh, a few minutes at a time. And then at the end of this day, going, the space station's done. Houston called up and said, just kidding. It was a false alarm. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go back, wear your oxygen masks and take some samples just in case. So when I went back into this, American side having abandoned it. It was so eerie. It was like some Star Trek movie of, you know, boarding this abandoned spaceship. There was things floating around that we had just left in a panic as we were going down the Russian side. It was really eerie. It was like a ghost ship. And it, in the long run, it ended up being a false alarm. The computer had had some radiation hits that, that had it give out some bad data, thankfully. But we really spent a day thinking it was it was a bad day in space. You mentioned movies there. A lot of movies are, are set in space. And as a professional, you must just look at them and go, well, that wouldn't happen. And that's not right. <laughs> but which movie has got closest to giving people who've never been into space an idea of what space is like? I'm not talking about the, the, the IMAX movies that NASA make. I'm on about like the Hollywood movies. Which one is the closest to the real thing? Yes, I'd say Beautiful Planet, since I filmed it. <laughs> yes, um, I know it, you would. <laughs> it, it's the, it, it, but as far as like fictional movie, so Gravity, I'm friends with the cinematographer, a guy named Chivo Lebeski. Yeah. Uh, well, he won the Emmy Award for Best Picture three years in a row, back to back to back. And Gravity was one of them. And visually, it's really good. It's, a, you know, it's an animated movie, yeah. but they got the visuals of what the space shuttle looked like and what uh, the space station looked like uh, really good good now thankfully there's not that total disaster explosion <laughs> using a fire extinguisher to fly to the chinese station you know they had to make it interesting to sell tickets yeah. but the, the visual gravity were pretty good a movie that gets the culture and spirit of space flight i think better than anyone is the right stuff right older movie and it's about chuck yeager and the sound barrier and the early mercury astronauts I, I just love the cultural and the interpersonal and the right stuff. I mean, I, I love that part of that movie. Uh, Zambo and I watched it the night before our launch on the space shuttle. So, Tell me about life, adjusting to life on Earth after being in space. I mean, do you find yourself leaving things in midair and they just fall to the floor a lot? <laughs> I did. After my first shuttle flight, I landed. I was in, at the hotel. My parents were down there and 
I took a water bottle and just, I went to like, I went to throw it to mom and it just dropped and hit the ground. So <laughs> I, 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 I did do that, but I was really a little bit concerned about it. I was afraid I'd be depressed, you know, postpartum depression. And so when I got back to earth, you land, you take a helicopter to the airport, you take a business jet 24 hours across the planet to get back to Houston. It's a 24 hour trip from uh, Kazakhstan to Houston. And while I was in space, my son had turned 16 and he got his driver's license. So 24 hours, I land in Houston, go to the gym for an hour and a half to work out. And then my son was like, all right, dad, we're going car shopping. So he took me to the car dealership <laughs> and it was completely normal. And I can remember driving down Nassau Road 1 by the I-45, the highway, and seeing this red lights. And I just remember thinking, I'm back. Like, I'm on Earth. Everything's normal. I'm back to life. And it, sh it really surprised me how immediately that light switch had gone on to, I'm not in space anymore. I'm back on Earth. And uh, it was a surprising but really good thing. I didn't really suffer. I think some guys kind of get the letdown, you know, post space flight let down and I yeah i think i think buzz aldrin in his book talks about he went through a, a hard uh, readjustment process didn't yeah he? and it's under you know if you win the super bowl what do you do after that or if you're hollywood mega star and then you don't have anything after that it it can be really tough and for me personally i didn't want to be you know hanging on to that thing i kind of wanted to move on to my next phase of life and be before it got to be too late so i you know, I wanted to write a book. I wanted to do speaking. I want to do a TV show. There's all these other things I want to do in life. So I just said, man, flying in space was awesome. I loved it. I met some great people at NASA and I had a great experience and now it's time to move on to the next phase of life. So thankfully I did not have to deal with that, but I know it is a struggle for some folks. Let's talk about NASA. Why haven't we been back to the moon? So can you imagine in, when I was a kid, I never would have guessed we'd be celebrating the 50th anniversary still in low Earth orbit and not being back to the moon. Yeah. I mean, it's it, like it's terrible. But after space flights, they sent us around and talked to congressmen and senators. And since I've left Air Force and NASA, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of folks in Washington about space policy. And the one point I always make is that it's not about the rocket science. It's about the political science. And the rocket science is hard, mm. but the political science is harder. And what we have lacked is for the last almost decade now, we haven't had a vision or a plan or a goal. Now, the space station is going great. The space station program, Kirk Sharman, the manager, they do a great job operating and flying people in space and doing science. There really is a lot of great stuff that NASA is doing with robotically, of course, but even with humans in space, and that's going really well. But beyond the space station, we had a program called Constellation that was start building pieces and parts to go to the moon and then eventually on Mars. That got canceled in 2009, and it was not really replaced with anything. So we've, we've been spending all this time with a lot of words, but not with actually not without an actual plan. And so one of the things, I, I just wrote some articles, as you mentioned, about uh, ha having a vision for the future of space flight. Y you need to know what your vision is. And with Kennedy, it was really simple. Put a man on the moon and bring him back safely to Earth. By the way, that was my favorite part of his speech, return him safely to Earth. <laughs> yeah, I bet, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. But we had a vision. And then we had political support. And the plan didn't change every four years when a new administration came in. Richard Nixon was president when Buzz and Neil landed on the moon, not Kennedy and not Johnson. Yeah. And they've actually put resources behind it. So while we have had a really good vision and a good plan in the past, we haven't necessarily had the dollars for it. And then that got canceled and then we didn't have a vision or the dollars. And so that we, we kind of need to figure out a way to make space and NASA less political. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's just, it's a human issue. And, it, and really all Americans support space. People around the world support space. In the UK, actually, you guys have fi are finally supporting human spaceflight with Tim Peake. And, uh, you know, for, for decades, Britain didn't support human spaceflight. And they supported the European Space Agency unmanned things, but not the human part. Mm -hmm. But, you know, countries around the world, 
people around the world are very fascinated by space travel. There's a lot of support for doing things. Um, we just need the leadership that will make it less of a political issue in America and put together a plan that can survive, you know, over over time. And a long-term plan, too, because, you know, even Apollo, I mean, I think it was supposed to go to Apollo 20 and it was cut back to 17, but beyond that, there wasn't a plan. It wasn't like there was there was a long-term plan for the continued exploration of the moon and supplying the moon. I mean, I always wonder why would they didn't... I don't know much about space flight or orbital mechanics, only what I've read. And, and there's that thing called the free return trajectory where it's possible to put something in in a, in a looping orbit between, between the Earth and the Moon. I always wonder why they didn't get a vehicle doing that and then they just needed one to launch from Earth up to that and then one from the vehicle down to the surface. And I know Buzz Aldrin has proposed a similar system for Mars. Do you think they should have really worked on that earlier? Well, I, I, and I agree with that plan, I think, for Mars... You need a Buzz calls it a cycler. He has a cycling path. Mars is his vision, and I think um, that's an important part of it because you can take like the habitat or the transfer module. You don't need every time you take an air. You take British Airways from London to New York. Boeing doesn't build you a new 787, right? <laughs> yeah. So the the same way, why spend a few billion dollars on a new spaceship if you can figure out a way to launch people from Earth, get on that transfer vehicle, go to Mars, and then um, it, I think that's an important way to do it. I agree. Yeah. Now, NASA has announced plans for this uh, new space station orbit in the moon called the Deep Space Gateway. And you, you, I read an article. Uh, you, you've had a lot to say about this. You don't think it's necessarily a great idea. Why is that? Yeah, well, I know the, the folks that came up with that are some of the smartest rocket scientists, and they're really great people. And I've sat in the room with the chalkboard full of this drawn up in different orbits and stuff. The problem with it is the the goal of Deep Space Gateway is to find a reason and a job for the SLS rocket and the Orion capsule. It's not, we want to go to moon or we want to go to Mars and this is what we need to do to get there. It's the self-licking ice cream cone. It's, well, we have these things, now what do we do with it? And, and NASA was charged with finding out something to do with these vehicles that we have and that's just we're putting the chicken before the egg and what we need is to go we need to go to mars so apollo the moon program was not apollo it was mercury gemini and apollo yeah mercury was can we even fly people in space gemini was the most important part of it it was testing and developing the technologies that you needed for apollo like rendezvous spacewalking, multiple crew members, long duration missions, all the stuff you needed for Apollo was tested in Gemini. Yeah. And then we finally got to Apollo. So what we need to do now is figure out, do we want to go to Mars? If we do, what's the Gemini that we need? What are the technologies that we need to get to Mars? And the deep space gateway doesn't provide anything that we need for anywhere. It, it's basically building a, a space station piece by piece in orbit around the moon is, is what deep space gateway is. And we already know how to build a space station. I, I actually finished building the space station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we know how to build modules and assemble them in orbit. The difference is if you put it in orbit around the moon, it's a lot farther away and you, it's a, you have to add a zero on your launch costs. It's really expensive to get stuff way out there. And it's really dangerous because the radiation environment is really terrible in orbit around the moon. And if astronauts are going to be doing science, it's going to be a much smaller space station. There's going to be much less crew time because you can only spend weeks there rather than months like you can on the space station because of radiation. And so at the end of the Deep Space Gateway program, we don't have anything that benefits us in any way. We already know how to build a space station. And if you want to go to the moon, you're better off going to the moon rather than going to this orbital space station, which costs you time and money and propellant to get there. And then it costs propellant to get down to the moon. So I just don't see any benefit for it. And I, I know the reason we're doing it is just to find something for Boeing and, or not, I don't want to pick on Boeing, but to find something for the, uh, these programs and congressional districts to have a, to have a, a reason for being and it it is it does not actually lead to important goals i think like going to mars is it just a job creation program then for the contractors in the uh in the congressman's uh, well, <laughs> areas you know it, it is but i but ironically if we actually had a mars program 
those same districts and that same SLS heavy lift rocket would have lots of work to do too. It would just be meaningful work that actually led to a Gemini program of testing and developing technologies that would be useful for the future. So it's not a question of if we don't have these space gateway, everybody gets laid off. There, there is useful work to be done, but if you're going to land on the moon, it costs more money than just building an orbital space station. So this proposal has come out in a time where we don't even have it in NASA administrator. It kind of was during the in-between administration plan. So I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not, Yeah. Um, but I hope it doesn't because if we end up pursuing it, it'll be several decades. And at the end of those several decades, we'll have a, another space station in orbit that just costs a lot more money and, we spend less time at and we won't have things like uh, electric space propulsion that can help get us to Mars and back faster. We won't have things like landers and how to build landers together because, you know, the, a Mars lander or a moon base would probably need multiple modules on the surface. And we've never put two things together on the surface of another planet. That would be a great technology to test out. A lot of the stuff we need for actually going places there's no there there where deep space gateway is going. Yeah. It's a high altitude. Was it a rectilinear orbit? Halo is the acronym for it in cislunar space. And so if you're going to, whenever you hear the term cislunar space, that's like a fancy term for there's nothing there. <laughs> right. So would, as far as getting to Mars goes, would, would Elon Musk and his SpaceX uh, project, would that be a better bet? Well, the, the thing about Elon is he's building rockets and he says he's going to build, and I think he will, a heavy lift rocket. It won't be as big as SLS, and really, bigger is better because if you have smaller rockets, you need then you end up needing to build things in space, and it's more efficient just to have one thing and launch it on one launch. But you know, if he can provide the heavy lift rockets, that'll go a long way towards getting people to Mars. One of the most important technologies for Mars, I think, is faster way to get there. And there's a thing called electric propulsion. What we do now is chemical propulsion. You burn an oxidizer and a fuel. You burn that just like combustion on Earth, and that makes you go a certain velocity. Electric propulsion is you use electricity to shoot out a lightweight gas at really, really, really much higher speeds. The exhaust goes away from the rocket at very high speeds which means the rocket ends up going a lot faster than a chemical rocket can go. And you can get to Mars and back in about a year using electric propulsion, whereas a chemical rocket mission takes about three years. Wow. And so that extra two years, that's a lot of underwear you have to pack for those two years. And c can you generate the electricity in space as well? So you hit on the most important part. You can if you build a nuclear reactor. Right. NASA has lots of electric propulsion satellites that we're flying right now. We have them in orbit, but they use kilowatts of power with solar panels because they're really small, and you can do that with kilowatts. It's, but with humans, you need megawatts, so you need an actual nuclear reactor, which can be done. The Russians have flown nuclear reactors in space back in the 60s, but that requires a political will that I don't think America has. I, I just don't, I think we have such a short attention span, and we have so many special interests. Uh, but there are other countries in the world that don't have the political sausage factory that is Washington, right? So if you've made an international partnership, that would be a great program for another country would be to bring the nuclear power plant. You know, America could bring the lander, the Europeans could build the habitat module, and another country might be able to bring a nuclear power plant. And when you put all those things together, you can get to Mars and back in a year. If you do the chemical thing, my friends at NASA that know what they're talking about and studied it have said it's seven to nine SLS launches to build the Mars ship, which is insane. The, the launch rate for SLS is going to be one a year. Like you might be able to push it up to two a year. <laughs> but it, in other words, it's going to take years and years just to build one Mars ship in Earth orbit to get it ready to go to Mars on this three-year journey. And the the cost for that is prohibitive. The length of time is prohibitive. And I, I just don't think you can do that. Plus, the poor crew is going to be floating in space for probably a year and a half yeah. getting irradiated. And it's just not a good 
that's not the way to get to Mars. I think you get there and back as fast as you can. Tell me about the book, Terry Vert's View from Above, An Astronaut Photographs the World. I am super excited about this book. It's a space mission in book format. And so I tried to use photographs. I ended up taking the most photographs ever on my mission. It was 319 plus thousand pictures. Which is more photographs than anyone's taken from space, isn't it? That's what the NASA people said. that They were so happy when I landed because they didn't have to downlink so many pictures and catalog them. <laughs> it's a National Geographic book, so the photography aspect is really important. There's a lot of beautiful images in there. But it's also full of stories. I wrote the book myself, which I really wanted to write it myself without a co-author. And um, that was something I was a little nervous about being a math major. My high school English teachers would have been surprised, to say the least, that I wrote a book. But I just really enjoy the process of writing. What I What this book is not is a memoir. There's been a million memoirs out there. Um, that story has been told. And I didn't want to write a book that's already been written. It's also not a photography atlas of the earth. It's not, you know, a reference book. It's what I try to do is combine beautiful and interesting pictures and stories from the space mission so that you get a sense of what it's like to fly in space. Is the photo of you giving the Vulcan hand signal in there? <laughs> So we had a chapter seven is about spacewalking. I did three spacewalks in a week and the day before the final one. So it's been a killer week. We've been working nonstop. Um, I got an email from a friend of mine at NASA that said Leonard Nimoy had passed away. So Mr. Spock died. And can you do something? And I didn't know what to do. I had a spacewalk tomorrow. I didn't have time. So I ran down to the cupola, which is the seven windowed observing module. And I did the Vulcan live long and prosper salute. And I, I just took a picture of it, and I was worried about my hand. I had to get the writing light. I uh, didn't want to show all my wrinkles. And, you know, I was, like, trying to get the Vulcan salute framed. I took the picture, and I tweeted it. And it got tens of millions of views. The, that's the PAO <laughs> folks. Came, it was, like, the most popular tweet ever. And tens of thousands of likes within an hour or something. And it was just a great tribute. People around the world love Spock. I love Spock. I, I, it was a really cool tribute. What I didn't know... If you look at the image, and it is in the book, um, in the background is Long Island and Cape Cod and the east coast of the U.S. And Boston is right in the center of this picture. And that was his hometown. Wow. I had no idea. I just, I was worried about the lighting and where's the sun and getting my hand exposed. And, and uh, I just happened to have his hometown in the background. And that was... In the F-16, we had a saying, I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> and uh, this was an example of, you know, divine intervention, or I don't know what it was. But it was, I was definitely more luck than being good because it was not planned. But I was really, really excited and happy that, you know, it was like a little, just a bonus tribute to, for Leonard Demoy. That is just brilliant. So the book is out now. It is Terry Vert's View from Above. An Astronaut Photographs the World. Thank you so much for your time today talking to me, Colonel. I've really, really enjoyed our chat. I'm a bit of a fan of space, and I've never spoken to an astronaut before, so it's a real thrill for me. It really is. Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you, and hopefully I'll be at the UK for a few days at the end of November. Um, I'm hoping to stop by on my way to Antarctica, uh, but I'll, I'll be doing hopefully some media there and maybe a book signing and, and enjoying some late November British weather. Fantastic. Well, I hope I can get my book signed. We'll have to make that happen. Okay. Commander Terry Verts, thank you so much for your time. Live long and prosper. And live long and prosper. Cheers. <laughs>